Come on, go ahead and grab a seat. Thank you, worship team, for your impromptu song. You know, that's, that really is the, the call of our life, to be a people of song and worship that is unto a place of his presence, to unto a place that we have cultivated in song and worship and prayer and every capacity that we are a people that is deeply impacted and deeply woven by the work of his spirit. This is going to be and is called to be our primary identity that we are a people of his presence. Beyond anything else, beyond any other identifier, beyond any other element, that we are a people of his presence. Stay right there, okay? So they're, they're from Mount Sinai to Eden to the, to the Pentecost to the age to come. We would be a people formed in fashion, moving in the winds of the Spirit. And the series that we're in over these next five weeks is going to look at how do we cultivate his presence in our life? How do we move in and out of the seasons and how do we move in and out of the places where we remain steadfast and firm as a person who is in his presence? And I believe each of the, these five places we're going to look at have unique components, unique elements, unique places for us to learn how to cultivate his presence, the idea of a thin place, a place where heaven and earth are thin together. And we find ourselves in that space here today. You know, there is a difference. There's a difference between Simply the indwelling of the Spirit and a relationship with the Spirit. Yeah, he's everywhere, uh uh-huh. And yes, he is in us by the confession of your mouth. He's, his spirit dwells inside of you. But that's not the preeminent thing for you just to have the spirit in you. The idea of the gospel is that you'd be one walking with the spirit. In movement and cultivating relationship with him. When Paul says in 2 Corinthians, I bless you with the grace of the Savior, the love of the Father, and the koinonia, the fellowship, the, the interwovenness, deeply sharedness of your life with the Spirit, he's not talking about indwelling, he's talking about intimacy. If we're not careful, we can equate the indwelling of the Spirit with intimacy with the Spirit. Just because he's in us doesn't mean you're with him. Oh, come on. That stepped on someone's toes. Come on. Just because he's in you doesn't mean you're with him. I mean, how many marriages have you seen that are legally married? They live in separate places, separate floors, separate rooms, and they're still married. You might be legally married, but you ain't one. We're called to be those who are one with the Spirit walking in the movements with him, and that's what this series is about. How do we foster in these places of our life this oneness with him? We begin, if you're taking notes, we begin with fostering his presence in the wilderness. Thanks, Kay. Fostering his presence in maybe the hardest places of our life. This has been, for myself and I think my family, one of the hardest seasons we've ever had. August, mm -mm, July 14, we come back from a global worker retreat where all of our global workers from around the world are gathered. We spend a week long of ministry to them. We get back, I come through through customs and I turn on my phone because I've been on the plane and I get a message from my mom that says, Joel calling me, daddy's in the ICU. And that my dad has had a multiple amounts of health challenges over the years. 20 years ago, had colon cancer. 13 years ago, had issues with his heart. Uh, a year and a half, seven years ago, died in our driveway, resuscitated a miracle unto itself. A year and a half ago, was diagnosed with multiple myeloma and had been working through all kinds of health issues. And we knew health was not great, but the hope was we had more years than what we had. And I get a phone call that says dad's in the ICU. And this precipitated for the next 29 days, a life that was really lived in three places here at the church for 
for four, five, six hours fostering the leadership of the church here, and then I would leave the office and go to the ICU and spend three, four, five, or six hours with there because, you know, my Italian mama married to him for 60 years was not going to leave him by himself. So I'd have to go up, I'd have to go to the hotel, the hotel, ha, he thought it was a hotel sometimes. I'd have to go to the hospital to kick her out as they go home and shower and get clean and eat. And then whatever I had left in eight, nine o'clock, come home and see the kids and the family. This precipitated for 29 days and was deeply hard. And many of you prayed for my family, for my wife, for my mom, for myself. And it was two weeks ago. We'd come to the last bit. We had tried everything, but had one last effort. How many been there before? And there was a sense that this may not go like we wanted it to go. So I called up Pastor David, and I said, Pastor David, can you get ready to preach? Because I'm just not sure where we're going to be. So procedure happens on Friday, found out that it did not achieve the goal we wanted. And I said, David, I want you to preach. And how many were here that Sunday? I mean, he only preached for like five minutes. He sang for 37. <laughs> Love you, Pastor David. But you know that sermon that he preached didn't come out of, a, out of a, a Google search. That came out of a deep well of his soul and his heart. And I am thankful for a pastoral team that in the moment, like your worship team, can pull from the deep recesses of what God has. Well, sure enough, sure enough, on that Sunday at 1158, my daddy passed away. You know, family, grief's not linear. Let me just do a pastoral moment here. Grief is not linear. It comes in waves. It comes in cycles. And it doesn't do you or anybody any good for somebody to tell you. You just got to get over it. It's okay. Step into the pain. Step into the tears. Step into the sense of loss. And with the Holy Spirit, there is another day coming for you. But it's okay in the moment. And resist the temptation and let somebody else tell you how you're supposed to grieve. I'm thankful for my incredible wife. Couldn't got it without, without you. And so we're coming in for these two weeks into this sermon series about cultivating his presence. And I've been thinking, Lord, is this really where we're going? Is this, is this really what you're asking Joel Solomon to have to maneuver in this moment in time and to cultivate your presence in this place and loss and hurt and pain and unanswered questions that we have? And I sense the Lord say this to my heart, if my presence can't meet you in the wilderness, then what's the point? If I can't meet you in shale, what's the point of meeting you on the mountaintop? If I can't meet you in the pain of a bad doctor's report, if I can't meet you in the scope of the midnight hour when you got no answers for what's happening, then what's the point of me meeting you at all? I heard him say, yes, the thin place is where you're starting because that's the place that you learn about my presence the most. That's the place where I form you and teach you the depth and the width and the power of my presence. I sense we learn more about his presence in the barrenness of the desert than we do the abundance of paradise. And this is what I think happens in the pattern of our life. Wilderness comes. Uh, pain and loss and hurt and frustration happen. And, and what takes place in this moment is kind of one of two things. Out of our hurt and out of our pain and out of our frustration, out of our anger at times towards God, we just retreat and throw our own selves a pity party and we move away from the presence of God. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to sing to you. I don't want to pray to you because you didn't do what I thought you're supposed to do for whatever reason. And I'm going to retreat back to here just because I don't like what's happening. Anybody ever have a moment where I don't want to talk to you, Jesus? You omnipresent anyway. You know everything that I know. Before I say it, well, just read my mind because my word ain't going to say it to you. Wilderness causes, if we're not careful, 
a place of retreat. And yet, when we look at Scripture, the point of wilderness is not retreat, it's engagement. The point of wilderness is not a retreat from his presence, but actually a fostering of a work of his spirit. Because heaven's plan is for us to pursue him with a deep longing. And sometimes, family, wilderness is the only thing that can do it. Sometimes wilderness is the only thing that pulls out of our hearts the pursuit to cultivate the place of his presence. And if he meets us there, then he meets us anywhere. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Hosea. Hosea is a quintessential text about the wilderness place. It's been an anchor text for my own life. And we see some principles in this in this text that we're going to look at, how do we cultivate this place of his presence? Let me give a quick overview of Hosea. God had all, always equated idolatry, the worship of other gods, with adultery. In the same way that a man and woman is meant to be exclusive with each other in marriage, so God was expecting Israel to be exclusive with him. In the time of Hosea, Israel had wandered away from their affections towards God, and they and they had 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 began worshiping other gods and 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 he's wanting to show them two things number 1 i want you and i want you alone and number 2 despite your tomfoolery i'm still married to you turn to somebody and say thank god for his faithfulness come on and so he finds this dude named Hosea, a prophet. And he says, Hosea, I want you to be a, a life marker of how I am faithful to my bride. And as a minister, I'm like, cool, 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 I'm down with this one. Make my entire life about how faithful you are to us. So he says, so Hosea, go find a woman in prostitution and marry her. Hashtag holy nope. Don't come up to me and say the word of God came to you to go marry a woman on prostitution. I'm going to tell you that ain't Jesus. But it was for Hosea. So Hosea finds a prostitute named Gomer. And so and marries her, buys her from her pimp. And then, and then together they have one child. She continues to play the role of the harlot, has two more kids, not with him. So now she's got three. After three kids, she's like, deuces, I'm out, and goes back to her pimp, her John. And he is left with three kids, only one his own. Don't know who the other two baby daddies are. And God says, now that you know that I'm faithful to my people, go back and get her again. Go buy her a second time, and may that covenantal relationship show you that I am that committed to you. And in that place, in that moment, God recovenants with Israel in a similar fashion, and this is how he does it. He pulls Israel out of their safe places and brings them to the wilderness to covenant with them that they'd foster a fresh relationship with him. If every Bible's turned to Hosea chapter 2, we're just going to read a couple of verses and learn our lessons this morning. Hosea chapter 2, the wilderness approved Bible has paper and leather. It's up on the screen for you too if you need it. Verse 6, therefore I will, this is God speaking to Israel, therefore I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. Verse 7, she will chase after her lovers, but not catch them. She will look for them, but not find them. And then she will say, I will go back to my husband at, as at first, for it was better off with him than it is now walled off away from my lovers. Verse 14, therefore, this is God now speaking to Israel, now that she's been walled off in the wilderness, therefore, I'm going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly or lovingly or comforting to her. And I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. We'll come back to this. And there, say there. And in that place of transformation from despair to hope, there she will sing as in the days of her youth. And that day, verse 16, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer call me my master. Verse 19, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you in righteousness and justice and love and compassion. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you will acknowledge the, God, the Lord your God. 
The first thing that we find out in the wilderness place, the first thing that happens when we're drawn into this area of hardship and pain is this. My own longings are exposed. Israel, just like us at times, have wandered away from a primary pursuit of his presence. And cultivating his presence begins with actually wanting his presence. You ain't going to cultivate something that you don't want. My seven-year-old Cora taught me that. And until I realize my longings have been towards something else, I won't actually cultivate the presence with him. Until I find out I don't want other stuff, I won't actually say it, but I want you and you alone. And what God oftentimes has to do is show us ourselves. Sometimes the enemy is not out there. Sometimes the enemy is in me. And so what does he do? He's going to grab you from your pursuit of other things, bring you into the wilderness where it's just you and him. And in that place, he's going to cultivate in you a desire for him. Look at our text. He says this, therefore, I'm going, verse 6, to block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way and plight is towards other lovers or other things. And she will chase after those lovers and she will not catch them. She will look for them and she cannot find them. And then she's going to say, I want to be with you. This is the divine work of God, is to get you to shed off your other lovers. This word wall that he uses here in verse 6 has a sense, not of a military wall, not of a wall to keep things out, but it's a wall to keep things in. It's actually the word used as a shepherd would build a sheepfold or sheepfold. He does this for the protection of his sheep. He does this to keep them in one place so that the sheep can know the shepherd and the shepherd can know the sheep. Family, it is God's divine leadership to wall you in sometimes from you. I'm going to say it again. It is God's divine, perfect leadership to sometimes wall you in from you. Sometimes we in the wilderness, as we'll talk about in a minute because something happens to you, sometimes we in the wilderness because you did you. You know what a a simple definition of divine judgment is? If you're taking notes, write this down. It's the removal of anything that hinders wholehearted love. Whether it be in the nations, whether it be in the government, whether it be in the affairs of man, or simply your and I's life, divine judgment is this, the removal of anything that hinders wholehearted love with him. And he likes you too much to let you pursue other lovers. It is his perfect leadership to lead you away from the stuff that distracts you from the real place of his presence. Sometimes that promotion that you didn't get, that wasn't the devil, that was not man, that was God himself. And he said, you are chasing that corner office, you are chasing a big bank account too much, almost strip that thing away because you've made money, you're God. Sometimes that person that dumped you, Come on, that significant other that said deuces and walked away. That wasn't the devil stealing him or her away from you. That was you have been chasing a bed with a man or a woman in a manner that is inappropriate. And he said, I like you too much for you to be over there. So I'm going to strip you out and wall you in. We cultivate relationships with stuff we're not too, too often. And for the love of God towards us, he says, let me strip away this thing, bring you into a wilderness place where only you and I are together. We need to stop cursing God for some of our wildernesses and thank him for it. You know, we like to sing that song, you a good, good father. It's, help me out, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm what? And I'm loved by him, and it's who I am, it's who I am. You know that song? Come on, help me out, deep. you kind of quiet. But then there's that bridge to him being a good, good father. We say, and you're perfect in all of your, you're perfect in all of your, to us. He's perfect in his promotion. He's also perfect in his discipline. We can't celebrate his perfection of leadership when he blesses us and curse him when he he decides to discipline us. It's all perfect leadership. 
We can't celebrate his divine protection from an accident, from a thing here, and not celebrate his perfect sovereignty when he doesn't answer the prayer to heal. Either he is or he isn't. And in his perfectness, he exposes the entitlement in her heart. He exposes the selfishness in her heart. In his perfectness, he exposes our pursuit of other things. Because with those other things present, we won't do the work to cultivate his presence. And only the wilderness does it. Only the sheep pen that he makes and forms around us does it. He does it out of affection for us. But he doesn't just expose me in that place. He actually exposes himself. You see, ultimately, my desire to cultivate his presence is only in response to him. It's only in a response of encountering him that I will then reorder my life to encounter him. Look at what he says in our text. He says in verse 14, therefore, I'm going to allure her. I'm going to lead her into the desert place, and I'm going to speak tenderly to her. These words in the Hebrew have a sense of flirtatiousness. It has a sense of love and care and affection. And he says, when I pull you out, when I strip away your lovers, when I get you alone with me, I'm not going to speak condemnation over you. I'm not going to tell you how much I'm disappointed in you. I'm not going to tell you how angry I am with you. What I'm going to tell you is how much I love you and how much I want to be with you. And sometimes only a wilderness sheeped in place actually allow us to slow down long enough to hear him say it to us. Because we're so busy running everywhere else after every other thing, we can't actually hear him say, but I want you. But I want you. But, But I want you. Family, it takes God to love God. It's the Spirit of God, Paul would say, poured in our hearts that causes us to then to say, Abba, Father. It's the love of God in me that then transforms me for me to say, but God, I love you. And sometimes we are so busy chasing other things, we don't hear the words we need to hear of I love you to then respond back to say, I love you in return. (laughs) my family is a word of affirmation family and when we say I love you we assume there's a response back of I love you and the first couple times I married my wife I'd say I love you honey and she'd say thank you I said no 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 no. I'm looking for something else (laughs) see you see every time Israel covenants with God you know where it is it's in the wilderness God's covenantal name is given to Moses in the wilderness. His covenant of the Ten Commandments is given in the wilderness. When when he needs to recovenant Hosea, he brings him into the wilderness. Every time, time and time again, when he wants the covenant in love with you, he pulls you out of your chase of other places and says, let me speak to you so you can hear me. There's one thing that I, maybe above all else, remember about my dad. I'm growing up and have all kinds of sports stuff coming and going from practices and things. My dad's a local pastor for 44 years in a small little town, basically running the church himself. As you can imagine, all kind of stuff happening there. And whether I was busy with things and he was busy with things, at some point in that day or that evening, life was going to stop and he was going to say one thing to me. Joel, come here, son. Joel, I love you. And there's nothing you can do to make me love you more. And son, also, I love you. And there's nothing you can do to make me love you less. I just love you because I love you. That little phrase, the phrase I speak to my kids Often. 
But how was I going to hear it? Not because he texted me on the go. Not because he, he, he did a quick email to me. It was because at some point growing up, every day, every night, I was going to hear them words. The, the life was going to stop. He was going to sheep pen me in so I could hear that word, I love you. And those words settled a young boy's identity that I didn't have to chase after every other thing, every other lover, every other element, because I knew my daddy loved me. Some of us are chasing after every other thing because you have not heard the word of your Savior. You have not gazed into those eyes of affection and fire that says, above all things, I love you. And when he says it, he's not mostly angry. He's not mostly upset. He's not mostly frustrated. He is in deep affection for you. In the wilderness places that get you to slow down long enough so you can hear how much he cares for you to expose your heart and expose his. But we don't end there in the wilderness place. That's the, this, 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 this place of affection and cultivating. That's, that's what he wants to do. But the question becomes, how, how then? How then in a wilderness place are you going to cultivate this deep Element. And I believe there is one preeminent thing the wilderness teaches us to do, that is to sing. Above all else, the wilderness teaches us to sing. To sing when you got more questions than answers. To sing when it feels really heavy and dark. To sing when you got more bills than resources. To sing when the business goes under. To sing when the prodigal says, says, I ain't coming home. To sing when the relationship is going on the rocks. To sing when it's hot and heavy and there's no shade from the sun bearing down upon you. To sing when you're sad. To sing when you're angry. The wilderness teaches us one thing. It does not matter what's going on around you. Your job is to sing. And the way we move from the place of despair from the wilderness to the place of hope in the wilderness, the way we cultivate his presence in the darkest moments is we lift up our voice and we sing. And I'm convinced of this. If the devil can do one thing to your life, it's to get you to sing, to stop from singing. It's as if in the wilderness place, if he can get you to stop singing your song, he ain't got to do anything else. He ain't got to, he ain't got to bombard you with other things. He ain't got to, he, he, he doesn't have to do anything else because if you are not singing in your wilderness place, you will self-destruct. You will sabotage everything in your life unless you can sing. Because it's something about the lifting of our voice that moves us from a place of retreat and anger and fear and worry to a place of engagement and presence cultivation. We've got to sing. Look at our text. God has now moved Israel to a place. He's lovingly spoken over her. And what is her response? Her response is not more Bible reading. Her response is not more praying. Her response is not more fasting. Her response is not more community with each other. Her response is to sing her song. Verse 15, I will give her vineyards from there, place of sustenance and provision, place of abundance, And the valley of Achor would be a door of hope. Achor can literally be translated as the place of trouble, the place of despair, the place of disdain. And there she shall sing. It's the song from your lips that turns the dark night of your soul into hope. The day of transformation, the day of covenant that he talks about in verse 16, where we call him our husband and not our work master, happens because we've sang. If you can just keep singing, If you can just keep singing, the place of hurt and pain dissipates. 
I'm not saying it's happening in a day. I'm not saying even it's happening in a year. I'm saying if we can just keep singing, this place of heartache and pain begins to turn to hope again. And this is my fear. This is my, not my fear. This is, this is my sense. My sense is some of us, you're not in a wilderness place because you, you chased other lovers. You're in a wilderness place because something happened. And the enemy has come with all of his attempt to steal your song. And because grief can be so heavy, because mourning can be, can feel, because the sense of loss can be so profound, you've just stopped singing. I mean, you come to church, you sit, you sit, and, and you hear and listen to the song of the gathered church, and there, there is power in that, but you've stopped singing. You've stopped lifting up your own voice to sing to him. And what you don't know is you've stalled your journey out of the pain because you stopped singing. I was reminded of Jesus' darkest moment. He's on the cross for the first time in all eternity, separated from Father and Spirit. And do you know Jesus sang? You know, he sang Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I've cried out all day long and at night, and yet I hear not from you. Verse 1 and 2. But then he gets to verse 3. But you, O God, are holy, and you are enthroned in the praises of your people. In Jesus' darkest moment, he recites a psalm that speaks of God's inhabiting presence in his praise. He would dwell, he would remain in our song. Because when we sing, he comes. And the darker the wilderness, the more powerful the song. Sometimes you can't even sing. Sometimes it's just a hum. He'll take whatever you can give him. But you give him your song, you give him your hum, you give him whatever it is, and you begin to push back the darkness and you begin to sing. You tap into some Job that says, though he slay me, still I will praise him. You tap into some David that says his praise will, will forever be on my mouth. You tap into the psalmist that says, for the garment of praise, the spirit of heaviness goes away. It's in your song. It's in your song. It's in your song. It's like Paul and Silas in the jail cell. It's in your song. And only you can sing. Ain't nobody else can sing your song of despair. Ain't nobody else can sing your song of lament. It's in your song. And my sense is God wants to restore some of us some songs today. You've been silent for too long. I know the pain is heavy, and I know the darkness is dark, but if you'd sing, if, if you'd sing, if you'd sing, if you'd sing, you'd inhabit the praise, and all of a sudden that wilderness changes. My daddy passed away 11.58, August 11th. 11.48, we're sitting in his room. My mom's on his right, my sister's on her left. I'm in the back corner, snot crying, all the things. And my mama says to me, Joel, I want to sing. I don't want to sing. Joel, I want to sing. I want to sing. And the only way an Italian mama can do, she just looked at me. Okay, we're going to sing. Now, truth be told, they left me out to dry. We started to sing. Neither one of them sang. Left me on myself. I mean, I ain't going to win American Idol on a good day, but let alone in this moment. And I'm thinking, I don't want to sing. I don't want to sing. 
We are 10 minutes away from my daddy breathing his last. I don't, I don't want to sing. I heard, my, I heard just my daddy say to me, son, what do we do when it's hard? We sing. What do we do when you get a colon cancer report 20 years ago? We sing. What do you do when a prodigal says, I'm not living right? We sing. What do you do when the ministry isn't going how you want it to go? We sing. What do we do when you got to file bankruptcy? We sing. Son, what do you do when you got a bad in the ER with your kid? We sing. 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 And so I roll up to the foot of the bed, my mind all kind of scattered ways, and all I knew to do was this, to say this, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. It's time to sing your song. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I worship your 